The Hour of the Inevitable. Lara lay feverish and half conscious in Feliciata Semyonovna's bed. The S. Ventitskys, the servants, and Dr. Drakov were talking in whispers around her. The rest of the house was dark and empty. Only in one small sitting room did a lamp on a bracket cast its dim light up and down the long suite of rooms. Here Komarovsky strode with angry, resolute steps, as if he were at home and not a visitor. He would look into the bedroom for news and tear back to the other end of the house, past the tree with its tinsel, and through the dining room where the table stood laden with untasted dishes and the greenish crystal wine glasses tinkled every time a cab drove past the windows or a mouse scurried over the tablecloth among the china. Komarovsky thrashed about in a fury. Conflicting feelings crowded in his breast. The scandal. The disgrace. He was beside himself. His position was threatened, his reputation would suffer from the incident. At whatever cost he must prevent the gossip or, if the news had already spread, stop the rumors, nip them in the bud. Another reason for his agitation was that he had once again experienced the irresistible attraction of this crazy, desperate girl. He had always known that she was different. There had always been something unique about her. But how deeply, painfully, irreparably had he wounded her and upset her life, and how rebellious and violent she was in her determination to reshape her destiny and start afresh. Dot. It was clear that he must help her in every way. Take a room for her, perhaps. But in no circumstances must he come near her. On the contrary, he must keep away, stand aside so as not to be in her way, or with her violent nature there was no knowing what she might do. And what a lot of trouble ahead. This wasn't the sort of thing for which they patted you on the head. The law didn't wink at it. It was not yet morning. And hardly two hours had passed since it happened, but already the police had been twice and he, Komarovsky, had had to go to the kitchen and see the inspector and smooth things over. And the further it went the more complications there would be. They would have to have proof that Lara had meant to shoot at him and not at Kornikov. And even that wouldn't be the end of it. She would only be cleared of one part of the charge but she would still be liable to prosecution. Naturally, he would do everything to prevent it. If the case came to court he would get expert evidence from a psychiatrist that she had not been responsible for her actions at the moment when she fired the shot and would see to it that the proceedings were dropped. With these reflections he began to calm down. The night was over. Streaks of light probed from room to room and dived under the chairs and tables like thieves or appraisers. After a last look in the bedroom, where he was told that Lara was no better, Komarovsky left and went to see a friend of his, Rufina Onisimovna Voitkovsky, a woman lawyer who was the wife of a political emigre. Her eight-room apartment was now too large for her, she could not afford to keep it all up, so... She let two of the rooms. One of them had recently become vacant, and Komarovsky took it for Lara. There she was taken a few hours later, only half conscious with brain fever. 2. Rafina Onisimovna was a woman of advanced views, entirely unprejudiced, and well disposed toward everything that she called positive and vital. On top of her chest of drawers she kept a copy of the Erfurt program with a dedication by the author. One of the photographs on the wall showed her husband, her good Voigt, at a rally in Switzerland, together with Plekhanov, both in alpaca jackets and Panama hats. Rafina Onisimovna took a dislike to her sick lodger the moment she saw her. She considered Lara a malingerer. The girl's feverish ravings seemed to her nothing but play acting. She was ready to swear that Lara was impersonating Gretchen gone mad in her dungeon. She expressed her contempt for Lara by being brisker than usual. She banged doors, sang in a loud voice, 
tore through her part of the apartment like a hurricane, and kept the windows open all day long. The apartment was on the top floor of a building in the Arbat. After the winter solstice its windows filled to overflowing with blue sky as wide as a river in flood. Through half the winter it was full of the early signs of the coming spring. A warm wind from the south blew in through the casements. Locomotives at their distant stations roared like sea lions. Lara, lying ill in bed filled her leisure with recollections. She often thought of the night of her arrival in Moscow from the Urals, seven or eight years before, in the unforgettable days of her childhood. She was riding in a cab from the station through gloomy alleys to the hotel at the other end of town. One by one the street lamps threw the hump-backed shadow of the coachman on the walls. The shadow grew and grew till it became gigantic and stretched across the roofs, and was cut off. Then it all began again from the beginning. The bells of Moscow's countless churches clanged in the darkness overhead. And the trolleys rang as they scurried through the streets. But Lara was also deafened by the gaudy window displays and glaring lights, as if they too emitted sounds of their own, like the bells and wheels. In their hotel room she was staggered at the sight of a watermelon of incredible size. It was Komarovsky's housewarming gift, and to her it was a symbol of his power and wealth. When he thrust a knife into this marvel, and the dark green globe split in half, revealing its icy, sugary heart, she was frightened, but she dared not refuse a slice. The fragrant pink. Mouthfuls stuck in her throat but she forced herself to swallow them. Just as she was intimidated by expensive food and by the night life of the capital, so she was later intimidated by Komarovsky himself, this was the real explanation of everything. But now he had changed beyond recognition. He made no demands, never reminded her of the past, and never even came. And all that time he kept at a distance from her, and most nobly, offered to help her. Kologriviv's visit was something entirely different. She was overjoyed when he came. Not because he was tall and handsome, but because of his overflowing vitality, her visitor with his shining eyes and intelligent smile filled half the space in her room, making it seem crowded. He sat by her bed rubbing his hands. On the occasions when he was summoned to attend a ministerial meeting in Petersburg, he spoke to the old dignitaries as if they were schoolboys. But now he saw before him a girl who till recently had been part of his household. Something like a daughter to him, with whom, as with all other members of his family, he had exchanged words and glances only casually. This constituted the characteristic charm of their closeness and both he and his family were aware of this. Dot. He could not treat Lara as an adult, with gravity and indifference. He did not know how to speak to her without offending her. What's the big idea? He said smilingly, as if she were a child. Who wants these melodramas? Dot. He paused, and glanced at the damp stains on the walls and ceiling. Then, shaking his head reproachfully, he went on. Dot. There's an international exhibition opening at Dusseldorf. Painting. Sculpture. Gardening. I'm going. You know. It's a bit damp here. And how long do you think you're going to wander about from pillar to post without a proper place to live in? This Voigt woman, between ourselves, is no good. I know her. Why don't you move out? You've been ill in bed long enough time you got up. Change your room. Take up something. Finish your studies. There's a painter, a friend of mine, who's going to Turkestan for two years. He's got partitions up in his studio, it's more like a small flat. I think he'd turn it over furnished to somebody who'd look after it. How about my fixing it up? And there's another thing. I've been meaning to do it for a long time, it's a sacred duty, since Leaper, here's a small sum, a bonus for her graduation. No, 
Please. No. I beg you. Don't be stubborn. No. Really you'll have to. And in spite of her protests, her tears, and her struggles, he forced her, before he left, to accept a check for 10,000 rubles. When she recovered, Lara moved to the lodgings Kologriviv had recommended, near the Smolensky market. The flat was at the top of an old-fashioned two-story house. There were teamsters living in the other part of it, and there was a warehouse on the ground floor. The cobbled yard was always littered with spilled oats and hay. Pigeons strutted about cooing and fluttered up noisily to the level of Lara's window whenever a drove of rats scurried down the stone gutter. 3. Lara was greatly troubled about Pasha. So long as she was seriously ill he had not been allowed to see her, and what could he be expected to think? Lara had tried to kill a man who, as he saw it, was no more than an acquaintance of hers, and this same man, the object of her unsuccessful attempt at murder, had afterwards shielded her from its consequences. And all that after their memorable conversation at Christmas, by candlelight. If it had not been for this man, Lara would have been arrested and tried. He had warded off the punishment that hung over her. Thanks to him she was able to continue her studies, safe and unharmed. Pasha was puzzled and tormented. When she was better Lara sent for him and said, I am a bad woman. You don't know me. Someday I'll tell you. I can't talk about it now, you can see for yourself, every time I try I start crying. But enough, forget me. I'm not worthy of you. There followed heart-rending scenes, each more unbearable than the last. All this went on, while Lara was still living in Arbat Street, and Voitkovskaya, meeting Pasha in the corridor with his tear-stained face, would rush off to her room and collapse on her sofa laughing herself sick. Oh, I can't, I can't, it's too much. She exclaimed. Really? The hero? Ha, ha, ha. Dot. To deliver Pasha from a disgraceful attachment to tear out his love for her by the roots and put an end to his torment. Lara told him that she had decided to give him up because she did not love him, but in making this renunciation she sobbed so much that it was impossible to believe her. Pasha suspected her of all the deadly sins. Disbelieved every word she said. Was ready to curse and hate her, but he loved her to distraction and was jealous of her very thoughts and of the mug she drank from and of the pillow on which she lay. If they were not to go insane they must act quickly and firmly. They made up their minds to get married at once, before graduation. The idea was to have the wedding on the Monday after low Sunday. At Lara's wish it was again put off. They were married on Whit Monday. By then it was quite clear that they had passed their examinations. All the arrangements were made by Lyudmila Kapitanovna Cheperko, the mother of Lara's fellow student Tuzia. Lyudmila was a handsome woman with a high bosom, a fine low-pitched singing voice, and a head full of innumerable superstitions, some of them picked up and others invented by herself. The day Lara was to be led to the altar. As Lyudmila purred in her gypsy voice while helping her to dress. It was terribly hot. The golden domes of churches and the freshly sanded paths in the town gardens were a glaring yellow. The green birch saplings cut on Whitson Eve hung over the church railings, dusty, their leaves rolled up into little scrolls and as though scorched. There was hardly a breath of air, and the sunshine made spots before your eyes. It was as though a thousand weddings were to be held that day. For all the girls were in white dresses like brides and had curled their hair and all the young men were pomaded and wore tight-fitting black suits. Everyone was excited and everyone was hot. As Lara stepped on the carpet leading to the altar, Lagodina, the mother of another friend, threw a handful of small silver coins at her feet to ensure the future prosperity of the couple. And with the same intention Lyudmila told her that, 
When the wedding crown was held over her head, she must not make the sign of the cross with her bare fingers, but cover them with the edge of her veil or a lace frill. She also told Lara to hold her candle high in order to have the upper hand in her house. Lara, sacrificing her future to Pasha's, held her candle as low as she could, but all in vain, because however low she held it Pasha held his lower still. Straight from the church they drove to the wedding breakfast at the studio to which the couple moved. The guests shouted, It's bitter! And others responded unanimously from the end of the room, make it sweet. And the bride and bridegroom smiled shyly and kissed. Leudmila sang the vineyard in their honor, with the double refrain God give you love and concord, and a song that began undo the braid, scatter the fair hair. When all the guests had gone and they were left alone, Pasha felt uneasy in the sudden silence. A street lamp shone from across the road, and however tightly Lara drew the curtains, a streak of light, narrow as a board, reached into the room. This light gave Pasha no rest, he felt as if they were being watched. He discovered to his